Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, today we have part three in the goblin design series. Um, we'll be taking one of the goblins to a final render. So I'll see you in Photoshop. Okay, so we're back in Photoshop and it's finally time to start rendering these guys up. Now, if I sound a bit weird guys, I've got a bit of a cold, so bear with me, a bit nasal. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm just testing a bit of a skin color and putting in the first bits of a, um, a clipping mask. So this is a clipping mask here, what I'm doing here. Uh, and the idea is that you take your line dart and you draw underneath it. It doesn't matter what color you use. Uh, I just use a medium gray and just fill the entire character and make sure you're pretty, pretty um, accurate with your, with your edges. Because what you can do with this is you can use it to make selections um, and paint only within the clipping mask. And that's super handy so you can put big expressive strokes. Um, you don't have to worry about going outside the lines. Um, and it can kind of be a bit like a coloring book or something. And just like uh, every creative process with art, um, the more work you put in beforehand, the easier things will be in the long run. And this is this is a highly recommended step. <laughs> it, it stops you messing around with your edges. Uh, it, it, it's going to save you a lot of time, even though it seems like another tedious step before you get into the fun, juicy part of throwing down the colors and stuff. But do it. Uh, it'll save you time. So once we're done with these uh, clipping masks, and that took about maybe 15 minutes to do all three, so five minutes each, um, the next step is to decide what your local colors are. Now, the local colors are basically the, the true color of the object. So you're not applying any direct lighting. You're not applying any shadows to it. It's just uh, almost like a 50% gray, like in value. Um, and then just like not too saturated, not too desaturated, just a very plain middle of the range, this color. So the skin is kind of a green and then it's going to have some redder bits, some more orangey bits where maybe there's a bit of blood near the surface. So I was uh, looking at, you know, the knuckles and stuff and on the knees, um, in the ears and the cheeks, um, things like that. Places where I wanted a little bit more uh, variation in the skin tones because um, the skin's going to change color depending on what's underneath it, uh, how much blood flow it's getting, uh, things like that. Um, so you want a bit of variety in there to make it feel more organic. And uh, just here I'm, I'm fixing up some of the, the issues I had with the line art underlying that I forgot to do. <laughs> it was at this point that I kind of realized, I was like, oh crap, I forgot to do it. Uh, and it ended up taking twice as long because I had to shift all of the different color layers and things like that. The, the sooner you fix things, the easier it is. Like the further you go down that road, if you know there's something wrong, just fix it quickly. Because the further you go, the harder it is. It just, the, the time investment is exponentially greater <laughs> the longer you leave it. Anyway, I managed to fix it up pretty early, uh, so it wasn't too much of a problem. Uh, and then I got into why this method is so good, which is uh, the shadow pass, the multiply layer. Once you've got your local colors put in, um, like a nice, it doesn't have to be perfect either, it's just like a basic um, local color, you then create another layer on top of all of that basic color information that you just put in. Uh, set it to multiply and then drop the opacity down to around about 30 or 40 percent and then you just paint in the shadows so uh, when you start rendering uh, you first have to pick a lighting direction and then you just have to imagine is this part of geometry or the form receiving light or is it in the shadow and you just have to make that decision and go through and basically divide the image into those two things. Receiving light, not receiving light. And that's the first step in uh, creating a rendered form. Um, and then we'll come in again later with another shadow pass and we'll get into the deeper parts that are getting even less light and darken them up. And then later on, once we're done with all of the shadow passes, we come in with layers on top and add in places where um, the form is receiving more light. So you're working from a middle ground around about a 50% gray and you're building in the shadows and then building in the highlights on top. And this really is an awesome exercise to do. 
Uh, this is really training your brain to think about things as forms and to sort of abandon the idea of outlines and, and you know, that more comic book style. Um, and it gets so much more work done in your brain than uh, doing a photo study or something like that. Like, photo studies are useful. You can um, take a photo and get a whole bunch of information about how how forms act with different lighting situations, um, color and things like that. Although uh, photos do tend to modify colors quite a bit from the natural world, like your eye. So if you ever get a chance, try and uh, reference from actual life rather than rather than photos. Yeah, photo photo studies are a bit dangerous actually. Uh, it's a good exercise. You're getting you're getting a little bit of practice, but you're not actually using all the processing stuff that you need to learn um, if you want to get into more fantasy and creative art. Um, just pulling things from your imagination and drawing it. Um, because you, you rely entirely on the reference. But if you're doing this method, you need to create something that doesn't exist and then imagine how it would look if put into a real lighting situation. And your brain has to do all sorts of math to figure out like what's in front of what, what is casting a shadow on this, um, what is its form, and that's all stuff that your brain does not have to do if you're doing a photo study. So this is hard; <laughs> it takes a lot of practice. But once you figure it out, uh, there's a bunch of rules related to it, uh, and you can get there with just practice. You'll be able to draw anything, and uh, you'll need that if you want to be a concept artist or an illustrator. Because you're not always going to have reference. That's exactly what you need. Now, as we continue to refine all of these forms um, with more and more layers of shadow uh, and by working the edges to make it just right, uh, creating cast shadow, shadows and occlusion shadows and things, um, the line work becomes less and less necessary to uh, describe the form for you because the line work will separate planes um, and it will do a lot of sort of cheat work. It, it's it, it's really easy to draw a line line art and then you can just fill with a block color and you can kind of tell what it is. But as soon as you remove those lines, uh, if you haven't rendered it correctly, um, it's all going to fall apart. It's not going to look like anything. So the closer you get to a good render, the more you can remove that line work. Um, and you don't have to look at it so much and it'll just stand on its own. Um, and now what I'm doing is I'm adding in a little, um, like a second light source. It's just kind of a rim light almost uh, just in the shadow areas because you want um, you want to describe that form um, as well as possible uh, really make it look 3d so I've just got like a cool bluish light coming from the opposite side of the warm key light and I'm just going to use it to sort of turn all the forms that little bit extra um, to add some focus and just make it really pop out and this is more of like a cinematic or illustrative um, lighting setup. Um, next time you're watching one of those Marvel films or something, you know, like, um, I don't know, Avengers or something like that, and, and there's two people just sitting in what seems like a, a normal environment and talking, pay attention to the lighting. They, it is very deliberate. They don't just grab cameras and put them into, you know, a room and record them. Um, they've got these extremely um, well-designed lighting setups so that all of the forms read really nicely <laughs> uh, down to the point of uh, like there'll be a little blue light coming from one side and a nice warm light from the other side but uh, the person is standing in front of like a dark cabinet or something and the the dark side of the face is in front of it but it's catching a blue rim light so it stands out against the dark cabinet and stuff um, it's all very, very deliberate. Uh, if you're going to work in entertainment, you're going to need to understand all these different lighting setups and things. Uh, it's not really what I do. Uh, I'm just sort of more doing design and stuff here. But um, yeah, if you want to get some inspiration on how to light um, light things for uh, like an entertainment purpose or to, to show maximum clarity, um, yeah, do a little bit of... <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't spend all your time watching movies, but do when you are watching movies because you're gonna you're gonna spend some time, you know, relaxing and stuff. I don't want to tell you guys to go away and just like slack off and watch movies. It's gonna make you a better artist because it's not. <laughs> but if you are gonna watch movies, 
don't just watch the movie for the stories and the explosions and everything like that. Um, <laughs> have a look at the uh, the lighting setups and things and the compositions of the shots. You can learn a lot, okay? And maybe it starts to ruin a little bit the, the film watching experience. I, I know that I don't watch so many films these days because, you know, uh, it all seems kind of transparent these days. <laughs> Um, now that I, I think about this stuff so much, I'm, I'm sort of watching, watching uh, I don't know, Batman punching some gangsters or something. But I, uh, I'm thinking, oh wow, the way they've uh, they've they've lit Batman here so he stands out in a dark alleyway, even though he's completely black. That's really creative. Wow, I'm gonna try and do that in my next image. It does pull you out of the experience a little bit, but your artwork will benefit. So <laughs> it's all about priorities. You got to think. Uh, you know, am I going to just veg out and watch this movie or do I want to try and learn something from it at the same time? And for me, over time, I've kind of just realized that uh, movies, absolutely, you know, video games, they all pale in comparison to the fun that I have uh, when I'm creating art. So <laughs> um, when I'm watching those things, I'm thinking about the art because that's the thing that really gets me going. Um, and I hope it gets you guys going too. Uh, when you start to get a little bit better at this stuff, it just becomes so much more fun until you know distractions like video games and movies and things like that they just they just pale in comparison they're not worth um wasting all of your time on you've got too much stuff that you want to do it's just so much more entertaining and this guy's sort of coming to an end uh he's almost done uh, i was pretty happy with how he came out not not thrilled i think uh the color choices were maybe a little bit cold and pale but i kind of decided that i wasn't going to look back too much and try and tweak them uh it's, it's always better to just produce work on mass, you know? If you create an image and you look at it uh, and you don't really like it, you know, sometimes you can go back in and fix it and work on it, but it's usually better to just acknowledge the things that are wrong with it and then make something else. Maybe even try and draw the same concept again and do it better the next time. So with this one, I decided, you know, well, that's one down, he looks pretty good. I'm just going to finish him here, bing, there he is. Um, and then with the next one, I'll try and implement some of the changes that I wanted to see in this one, but I'm not gonna fix this one. Um, I'm just gonna race ahead and uh, you know, improve through iteration. So if you wanna see what those uh, changes are, then tune in next time, uh, and we're gonna jump into that next guy, the hammer-wielding dude. Um, I hope you're enjoying the series, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, yeah, I'm having a blast doing this and I've, I've got so many more ideas for things that I want to do when I'm done here with these goblins. Uh, we're going to move into some more complicated territory and start like introducing scenes and things like that and environment lighting, which completely changes things. So um, I hope you guys stick around for that. All right, that's it for today's show, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, etc., just leave them down below and I'll get to every single one. Um, next week we're going to jump in and draw the angry guy with the hammer, so that should be a lot of fun. I hope to see you there. Bye-bye.